Welcome to video six in our series on plants and insect herbivores. In this video, we're going to go through two stories of where a co-evolutionary arms race between plants and herbivores got a little bit out of control and impacted entire ecosystems. First is the story of the North American mountain pine beetle, Dendro Contus ponderosae. This little critter was the culprit behind the massive beetle outbreaks in the US and Canada in the early to mid 2010s. Colorado, Wyoming, Montana, and parts of California were particularly hard hit, with more than 42 million acres of forest being either damaged or destroyed. Around the same time, British Columbia and Alberta also experienced varying degrees of outbreak. On its surface, this looks kind of straightforward. An insect comes in and just goes to town on the trees, causing devastation. It doesn't look like a product of coevolution. But that's because you don't know the whole story. You see, conifers, like the pines in this story, have evolved formidable defenses to deter herbivores like the mountain pine beetle. One of their primary defenses is resin, a sticky, toxic substance that's stored under pressure in specialized ducts. When a beetle attempts to burrow into the bark, the tree releases the resin, which can physically trap and suffocate the invader. Resin also contains toxic terpenoids, a chemical that interferes with beetle physiology, further enhancing its effectiveness. This strategy is coupled with other physical defenses like thick bark, making it nearly impossible for an individual beetle to make serious headway on a healthy tree. As this defensive strategy arose over time, the selective pressure that it exerted on mountain pine beetles helped the beetle to evolve certain countermeasures. And in this case, rather than a specialized enzyme, the countermeasure was particularly a behavioral one. It's called the mass attack strategy. The mass attack strategy relies on the collective action of thousands of individuals. When a beetle starts to attack a tree as a food source or use it as a place to lay eggs, it releases pheromones that attract other beetles. As more and more beetles arrive on site and start to burrow into the wood, their combined efforts serve to depressurize those resin ducts. As the tree tries to compensate by taking in more water to repressurize the low pressure areas, it effectively ends up diluting its toxic compounds to sublethal levels. And once inside the tree, the beetles introduce symbiotic fungi that further inhibits the tree's water and nutrient transport systems, weakening that host even further. This density dependent strategy is highly effective, enabling the beetles to infest and kill even the most robust of trees. Infected trees also become a hotspot for beetle reproduction. This density dependent strategy is highly effective, enabling beetles to infest and kill even the most robust of trees. Unlike solitary herbivore strategies, which don't depend on population size, the beetles reliance on high densities makes their outbreaks explosive and devastating. These outbreaks have had cascading ecological impacts, both positive and negative, depending on what organism you are. Those that benefit from the mass death of pine trees, like sun-loving understory plants, grasses, shrubs, wildflowers, they've proliferated in areas once dominated by dense pine forest. Detritivores, which are organisms that feed on decaying organic matter, may also have benefited from the influx of dead wood, driving nutrient cycling and enriching the soil. Large herbivores, like elk, may have benefited somewhat from the increase in open spaces. Beetle populations themselves have expanded dramatically, taking advantage of the unprecedented availability of host trees. However, the negative impacts have been far more extensive. Shade-loving understory plants, like mosses and ferns, have struggled to survive in newly exposed canopies. Birds that rely on dense pine forests for nesting have experienced population declines, while animals dependent on pine seeds, like squirrels and certain birds, have lost critical food sources. Not to mention that the massive influx of deadwood also increases the risk of forest fire. But beyond this, these events have had even more far-reaching impacts. When trees die en masse like this, vast amounts of stored carbon gets emitted into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide as these trees decay, 
exacerbating climate change. It's estimated that from the 2010 to 2014 outbreaks alone, more than 300 megatons of CO2 will be added to the atmosphere. That's equivalent of the annual emissions of more than 60 million cars. Not only that, from an economic perspective, the timber industries of both Canada and the US have suffered catastrophic losses with billions of dollars in damages, affecting jobs and livelihoods and the greater economies of both countries. In response to these outbreaks, both countries tried various mitigation efforts with limited success. Strategies included things like thinning forests to reduce beetle breeding grounds, deploying pheromone traps to disrupt beetle communication, maybe selectively removing infested trees. Despite these efforts, the sheer scale of the outbreaks overwhelmed really any type of effective human intervention. Compounding the problem were warmer winters, which were driven by climate change. These allowed beetle populations to expand into previously inhospitable areas, including higher altitudes and northern latitudes. Changes to ecosystems, fire risk, atmospheric carbons, people's jobs, economies on a continental scale, all significantly altered because of the back and forth, this co-evolutionary arms race between a tiny beetle, no bigger than a dime, and its food source. Next is the story of the leafcutter ants. At first blush, this might not seem as dramatic as the story of the mountain pine beetles. For those of you who know the story, uh, you have various species of ants in tropical rainforests, specifically those in the genera Atta and Acromyrmex. These ants cut large segments of leaf, many times the size of their own bodies, and carry them back to their ant nests, where smaller worker ants chew up the plant material into paste-like substances. The chewed up plant matter is then placed in specialized underground chambers within the nests, where the ants cultivate a mutualistic fungus. The fungus thrives on the processed leaf matter and produces nutrient-rich structures called gongolidia, which ants consume as a food source. And that's about it. End of story. No, that's not it. That's not the end of the story. Not even close. Okay, remember, this is about the co-evolutionary arms race between plants and insects and how it impacts the entire ecosystem. So. Let's unpack this one a little bit. First of all, the reason that ants have evolved this strange behavior is to avoid the arsenal of defenses that they face. This includes chemical defenses, like alkaloids, tannins, and phenolic compounds that make leaves unpalatable and toxic. Not to mention the physical defenses, like tough, fibrous leaves, spines, and trichomes, which create structural barriers to feeding. When the ants take the plants back home to their little fungus farms, the fungus serves to detoxify many of those chemical compounds, rendering them harmless. But even so, the leafcutter ants are still highly selective in their foraging. They tend to avoid plants with the most toxic of defenses. And this can actually favor the proliferation of chemically robust plant species in heavily foraged areas, helping to drive plant community composition relative to the location of leafcutter nests. Furthermore, Leafcutter ants tend to favor the harvesting of leaves from fast-growing, sun-tolerant species over slow-growing, shade-tolerant species. Large-scale foresting and nest construction, which can span hundreds of square meters, can eventually create light gaps. This promotes the growth of pioneer species like Cecropia species and Piper species, which thrive in disturbed areas. Waste products of the ant fungus farms enrich the soil locally with nutrients, creating microhabitats that are favorable to specific plants and microbial communities. This can also attract detritivores like springtails, beetles, and mites, which break down organic matter and recycle nutrients. Predators like armadillos and ant-eating birds frequent leafcutter ant colonies, while parasitoids like forid flies specialize in targeting worker ants. Finally, leafcutter defoliation can reduce flowering in heavily harvested plant species, indirectly impacting pollinators like bees and butterflies. So the bottom line is that forest fragments that have significant leafcutter ant populations are markedly different from those forest fragments that don't have leafcutter ant populations. Oh yeah, and I forgot to tell you how they impact humans. Eucalyptus is a particularly favorite food for leafcutter ants, and this can be a real problem in eucalyptus plantations. 
Leafcutter ants also target crops like coffee, cocoa, and citrus, causing billions of dollars worth of damage in South American countries. So once again, we have a situation where a very challenging feeding scenario has evolved for insects, in this case, the leafcutter ants. But the counter adaptations that evolved, this practice of cutting and farming leaf fragments, has had far reaching impacts on local and regional forest fragments, not to mention causing significant ripples in the economies of more than a dozen countries. In these two stories, the evolutionary arms race between plants and their insect herbivores unfolds not just as a tale of adaptation, but as a driver of profound ecological and even economic transformations. From the catastrophic mountain pine beetle outbreaks reshaping North American forests and releasing massive amounts of carbon into the atmosphere, to the industrious leafcutter ants engineering tropical ecosystems and influencing regional economies. These examples demonstrate how an evolutionary tug of war between plants and their insect herbivores can make waves far beyond the participants themselves, reshaping entire communities and even impacting human livelihood. Well, that's all for today. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you next time.